Hi everyone, I'm Jen Riggins from the Agi Next team and today I am talking to Mary Williams. If you want to introduce yourself, you're going to be one of our keynotes at Agi Next 2021. We're in 2021 now, goodness. Um, please, <laughs> it's, Mary, it's welcome. A, a Amazing how quickly 2021's arrived, isn't it? So hi, I'm, I'm Mary Williams. Uh, I'm geek underscore manager on Twitter, uh, which is usually the best way to find me. I'm the CTO of a med tech company called Helix, where we use uh, AI to find ways to repurpose existing drugs for rare diseases. Uh, I'm also the chair of the lead developer conference, um, a technical advisor to the Kindred Venture Capital Fund, uh, and a trustee of Stonewall, the leading LGBTQ rights charity in the UK. Awesome. You've done really amazing things for important things that help the world. So that's great. I think in tech, we need to spend more time or also in agility in general coaching everything. It's about helping people. And if you can scale it as, ha ha, as is your talk is I believe five lessons I wish I had learned before scaling. Do you want to give us like a one minute teaser about what your keynote's going to be about? Yes, yeah, so I, I suppose I've had a, a number of uh, different scaling experiences. I, I was at the Government Digital Service when we first scaled up to, to deliver Gov. UK, which was 30 to 300 people in just under nine months. Somebody had given the Prime Minister a date, which isn't very agile, but is what happened. Um, but also at, at Moo and at, at Monzo. Um, and so the yeah, the, the talk I'm going to give is, is all about the, the lessons I wish I'd learned a little bit sooner that have made, made my scaling journeys easier had I known them, known them earlier on and hoping to share that with you all and help you avoid some pain. We hope people will join live, wink, wink, people, uh, listeners. But do you want to tease one lesson you've learned or a story about advanced agility at that scale? Probably one of my uh, one of my key learnings that that I think a lot of folks in in this community will will identify with was um, that uh, don't repeat yourself is a great programming principle, but it's a terrible human communication principle. So in, in Python in particular, we we say you know you should you shouldn't repeat code, you shouldn't write the same code over and over again, you should you should reuse it. Um, but I think when you're trying to get a message across to a to a team you almost have to say it until you're definitely tired of saying it before everybody will have really heard it. Um, and I think that kind of realization that repetition matters a lot for humans was, was one of the um, key things I messed up earlier on and have, uh, have tried to learn from as I've gone along these journeys. I have to also say um, in my experience in gender minorities in tech, you have to repeat yourself because otherwise you will get repeated, as I like to call it, when, you know, someone else <laughs> says what you just said and gets all the credit for it. So I do think we have to be redundant at times, but I think that's a really good point. Automate your code, not your humanity. Yes. The, um, there's a fantastic example, though, from um, uh, staffers in Obama's White House where um, women and other gender minorities realized this was happening to them, that their ideas were not being heard and they'd only be heard when somebody else repeated them. And so they uh, became a repeater network for each other. So if, if, the, if the idea was glossed over, one of the other women in the room or, or uh, non-binary folks in the room would notice it because I think um, we, we're quite tuned into that and then would go as Jennifer has just said I um, and and just kind of bring it back up again but with attribution every time which I, th I think is a, a a great practice to adopt if you haven't already in your teams and if you are the only woman or gender minority on your team the men better be stepping up to do that for you and vice versa it's not always us and for people of color it's the exact same they may be the only one in the team so you have to for sure what do you think is the best part about your job um so my job at helix um i think the the best part of that is that we've is working with a bunch of super super smart people um with all these different really deep specialism. So there's pharmacologists and um, bioinformaticians, chem informaticians, um, AI scientists, engineers, all, all these uh, curators, all these different people with these very, very deep specialisms. I'm one of the only people in the in the company, I think, who doesn't have a PhD because I, I couldn't afford to, to do my PhD. Um, at, but finding the, um, the overlaps and the ways that those different deep bits of expertise can come together to, to find something new. Um, that's the that's the the coolest kind of day-to-day -day thing. Um, I think the best part of my 
job overall though is is the mission is you know there's millions of people worldwide with these thousands of rare diseases that 95 percent of which have got no approved treatment no no um no clear treatment at all um and so finding ways to help this kind of historically very underserved group of, of folks is is a really um fantastic thing to get to work on it's it's great to get paid to work on something so amazing <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. To have paid to have a purpose is the life goal most good people have. It's interesting. First of all, a lot of those jobs I'd never heard of before. They're interesting new portmanteaus to put in my, my vocabulary. But it's interesting that you talked about rare diseases. Um, typically, they are in less funded research communities. Let's call it that, like underprivileged people. And it's interesting that you're talking about AI. So how do you balance the aspect that hey, there's a lot of bias in AI, there's a lack of data. Um, also, I'm in one of the COVID, like COVID vaccine clinical trials and something they've progressively said over and over again is we need more people of color in the trial. We don't know if they're gonna have those reactions. Also, we understand why they wouldn't wanna be part of the trial because often healthcare systems have left them behind. So how does your company deal with addressing rare diseases and AI when maybe you don't have access to that much data. I mean, so the way I, I do agree with you that there's a huge risk of, of bias with AI, but I think it's it's because it can be like, it's like money laundering for bias, right? People think that it's um, that it's unbiased because it's the computer or the algorithm coming up with something. But the the risk is that if you train on data that's very biased, then then you've got problems. And so, actually, some of the approach we're taking is a little less um, machine learning, which it, it, the specifics of typical machine learning approaches tend to suffer from that a lot. We're using um, something that's called deep learning. So it's it's more like if you taught a taught the computer to learn like humans would, but then it can do that at a, at a speed and capacity that, that's very different, um, and then provide it with a huge amount of um, literature, structured data, unstructured data, and we've got really amazing natural language processing as well. So um, we're, but we, the fundamental way that we that we avoid um, kind of it, it, it inappropriate uh, um, use, of, use of AI um, is by having all of these fantastic scientists in the company. So we're not trying to um, remove the role of humans in, in drug discovery or, or, or treatment um, uh, development. We're trying to augment humans. So rather than, so we may uh, have an algorithm that predicts a number of drugs that are um, of interest for a, for a particular rare disease, but then that goes to a pharmacologist who looks into it in detail, who decides whether it's worth pursuing. And then we test it in, in the lab as well. So, so we're always, um, backed by data and guided by um, human judgment and insight, and that's the that's the approach we're taking, rather than uh, what some other businesses have done, where they've tried to kind of remove humans from the equation. We're we're instead trying to make it so the um, AI and other um, mechanisms are, are doing what they can be best at, and some things computers can do that, that humans just can't. You can't review all the literature for a disease in five minutes the way some of these uh, some of these systems can. Um, but then to also make best use of, of human judgment and human understanding and, and human creativity, frankly, because a lot of what happens in drug discovery is you spot a possibility or a connection and you come up with a hypothesis and then and then you test it and see see what's really possible. Um, but but to, to go back to your original question, which was, you know, how do we how do we deal with the lack of data? The other thing that the Helix does is we build really we have we have and we continue to build very strong relationships with patient groups. So particularly in rare diseases, um, but I think in any community that's not wonderfully served by uh, by the medical profession, um, you tend to end up with lots of peer support uh, and lots of knowledge being uh, gathered and gained by uh, groups that are trying to support each other. I think we're seeing that with long COVID with the, the long haulers um, who are kind of self-organizing at the moment and, and figuring stuff out and sharing things back and, and so on. And that partnership with um, both patient groups and key opinion leaders, the kind of leaders in the field for these different diseases, that's the other um, thing that we do to, to make sure we've got the best insight possible. Um, and you, investing in natural language processing means we can do things like um, see the, 
you can you can even do things like looking at their chat rooms and spotting the symptoms people are talking about the most or things that might not be discussed a great deal um, by uh, in in the medical literature but are day to day the real um, challenges people are facing um, and spotting some of that uh, and being able to interpret it's really valuable just imagine if uh, had been available 10 15 years ago Maybe we would have, could have saved many more women's lives for knowing how women have heart attacks extremely different than men, differently than yeah. men. And really interesting also, I love the human side that you're describing because I think it's still the only way you can get ethics in that conversation is if you have a human touch and a creative touch in there, which is so important in the AI space. I was, I was very lucky my, um, my undergrad, uh, supervisor when I was at university who I who I would have done the, the PhD with if I if I'd been able to afford it um it was uh, Dr Joanna Bryson and she, she's a, a leading voice in in AI ethics and I think the um sensible design and and you know uh ethical by design is is absolutely the approach we have to take with um with all uses of ai and frankly with all systems like you can you it, you don't need ai to create a bias system you we can we can create those through uh traditional human discriminatory <laughs> intervention uh, just as easily right i can't believe it was like two years ago now um i gave a talk at, i actually applied for a talk at the own my own conference so that was questionable ethically <laughs> Um, well, I was actually stepping into someone who couldn't last minute go, but I thought ethic, AI ethics and ethics in general was so important. But my argument is you have to ask in every sprint, I think you should be asking, should you be building this? And what is the worst thing that could happen if it gets in the wrong hands? And while I'm very pro open source, that's a bigger question that has to be asked as well. What if yeah. someone uses this nefariously? Who would, and who would not, be, who would be excluded if this was to be scaled to a, a Facebook size, a billion population users, who would be excluded from it? And that's where your background in GDS is very interesting because I find government digital service is deeply rooted in, can everyone use it? Yeah. And there was some, there was some fantastic work in the, the early days of GDS by the, um, uh, oh, what were they called? Uh, like the digital accessibility, uh, but they were they were called something specific. It was um, oh, assisted digital. That's what it was. So for folks who might not be able to um, to to use digital services unassisted, what what was the method going to be to to provide assistance as well as all the accessibility work that um, that Josh and uh, Leonie and some of the led. Yeah. So important, and I have to ask since we. I, I put before, and of course, I want people to buy tickets to our our little baby conference, but and I believe in our conference, but yours is the gold standard. So what do you think <laughs> is the most important quality to making a great conference that's inclusive, even if it's online, because this one's going to be online, maybe the next one's going to be online. Um, uh so to be to be clear, I'm 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 very uh, I'm overjoyed to still uh, be the 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 chair for lead dev, but the, all the hard work is is done by the the team behind it. So Ruthie Arnott and and her uh, company that that was called um, White October Events, I think, is now the lead dev company essentially because the conference has got so big, um, and they do a fantastic job of this. And I think a lot of it's parallel to what we do these days in, in digital products, right? They're, they're very user focused. They do um, user research. They try to understand what, what people's real needs are. Uh, if you've ever attended Lead Dev in, in person, you may have been asked to, to do an interview or to um, talk to talk to one of the team about what you found most useful, people, people feedback and so on. And so I think um, that that's the one side is just being relentlessly um, customer focused or user focused. Uh, and then the other is that we we do um, when we're uh, both designing the, the lineup, but also or, you know, choosing um, the, the approach that we're going to take. But also a lot of the accessibility and, and inclusion features are, I suppose, more in the mechanics or the logistics of the conference. Right. Um, and we've we've generally taken um, with that, we've taken the approach of kind of putting on different hats and thinking about what it would feel like. So if you're a if you're a wheelchair user, how's this venue going to feel? How how is it going to are the um, lunch tables uh, set up so that if you're um, at at sitting in a wheelchair height rather than at um, standing and walking height, is it usable for you? Can you see everything um, and, and so on? Um, what's it, you know, 
are your options limited by the fact um, uh, by your childcare responsibilities? Let's let's offer childcare is something that we've we've um, been doing uh, for the last few years uh, since we've been able to afford it, um, and th and that kind of stuff. So I think taking the almost it's almost like personas, I suppose, to to put yourself in the um, in the shoes, but. I think the fact that the the core team that Ruth has built is is very um, is very representative also helps because you've got the lived experiences in the team of, of people from different backgrounds, different expectations, different experiences, and they'll pipe up and say, "Hey, this would this wouldn't be so cool for me," um, which I think is always uh, a great a great thing to have done as a as a leader. She's and she's fantastic at that. Great, lead dev is a gold standard. So congratulations to everyone involved as part of it. And I hope we can stand for it. We can stand up near it one day. Uh, thank you so much, Mary, for being a keynote and inspiring us on the last day of the conference, March 19th. You're kicking us off with five five things you wish you knew before you scaled. Yeah. Similar. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Mary, and happy new year. Happy New Year to you too. I'm looking forward to seeing you all in March.